Hello, I'm Robert Strand, and today I'm going to talk to you about first-class global environments, and in particular, the runtime aspect of those environments. In general, an environment can be seen as a mapping from names to objects. For example, there could be a mapping from strings to package objects, a mapping from function names to functions, a mapping from symbols to macro functions, a mapping from symbols to method combination meta objects, and so forth. There are two basic types of environments, namely lexical environments and global environments. Uh, lexical environments are used during compilation, and they're passed to macro functions in the ampersand environment uh, parameter. Uh, in the Commonlisp standard, the global environment is usually designated uh, or is usually named the null lexical environment and it's designated when nil is passed as this, uh, um, as this argument to macro functions. And then the global environment is designated. In a typical Commonlisp implementation, there is one single global environment, and it's not concentrated, it's spread out. So part of it is contained as slots in symbols. For example, a symbol typically contains a function slot that is accessible through the function symbol function. However, if you look at a symbol uh, named setf symbol uh, in a typical implementation, it's store, stored elsewhere. A symbol will typically contain a value slot, which contains the global value or the current value, depending on, on the kind of strategy that's used. And it's accessible through the function symbol value. And the rest of the environment is usually contained in various data structures accessible through special variables. The commonless standard recognizes multiple simultaneous global environments during compilation. Uh, there's the startup environment, which is the environment from which the compiler was invoked. There's the compilation environment holding uh, definitions used internally by the compiler. And this is the environment passed to macro functions as the standard requires. And finally, there is the evaluation environment for a compile time evaluation. For example, when you use the uh, eval when compile top level, uh, then uh, this is the environment being concerned. And there are some traces of multiple global environments in the standard as well. For example, if you look at the function find class, um, it says that this is meant to distinguish between <coughs> compile time and runtime environments. And since there no, is no way to create uh, classes lexically in Common Lisp, it has to be global. So the standard is obviously talking about two different global environments here. Uh, now, luckily for all existing Common Lisp implementation, the standard allows for all these global environments to be one and the same. So now let's move on to first-class global environments. What could such a thing be? Well, it's simply a standard object that contains all of those mappings required by a commonless global environment. And the motivation for um, having a first-class global environment, well, there are several. Um, sandboxing is one of them, and this is the main topic of this presentation, so I'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, you might want to have multiple global environments during compilation as recognized by the standard. And finally, uh, I actually invented first-class global environments partly for the purpose of bootstrapping SICL on a host commonless implementation without using tricks such as package renaming. Package renaming is, is used, for instance, by SPCL uh, in order for SPCL to be bootstrapped on a different host uh, commonless implementation. So specifically for sandboxing, I can see at least three uh, use cases, and these are roughly in the order of importance, at least as far as this presentation is concerned. So the first use case is to isolate parts of a commonless system from a regular user. Take, for instance, the internals of the compiler. We would not want to, for it to be possible to download a, 
a system from QuickLisp that could then in insert a Trojan horse in the code generator of the compiler. The second use case I can see is to allow for multiple versions of a system to be simultaneously present in a single common Lisp image. Uh, for example, there could be a conflict between uh, external systems. A user might want to install two systems, let's call them A and B, but A and B both use system C but require different versions of the system C. So sandboxing solves this problem by putting A and B in separate first-class global environments. And each of these systems can then have a separate version of the system C in it. The main functionality that the user might want from systems A and B can then be imported to the current work environment of the user without the functionality of C being even visible there, so there is no conflict between the different uh, versions of C. And the third use case is to expose a subset of common Lisp. Now, um, this is the common idea of sandboxing, which is that it should be possible for some malignant external or possibly malignant external agent to use the system without making it unusable. But in order for this kind of thing to work, there's a lot more that needs to be done, in, including to the read table and other aspects of the, the reader. Um, so uh, that requires a lot more functionality than, I, than I'm presenting here. Uh, so I'm particularly interested in case one here. And case one is essential for a what I call a safe system. And by that, I mean a system that should remain internally coherent in a consistent state. So when this criterion is, is violated, at best the system crashes, and at worst it gives the wrong, silently gives the wrong answer. So for example, if the code generator is altered, then an incorrect executable code could be generated, thereby violating this uh, requirement. First-class global environments exist elsewhere, and they're not particularly hard to design, and it has been done several times, but not for common Lisp as far as I know. But the hard part is making them uh, fast enough at runtime. Most proposals that I have seen require a hash table lookup for each function call, and that would slow down the function call so much that the entire system would be unusable. So uh, my paper was published at uh, ELS in 2015, and you can find it uh, if you want at this uh, URL that you can see here as well. So rather than going into the details of the protocol to access um, first-class global environments, I'm just going to show you the, the particular aspect that makes it fast enough at runtime. And I'll show it to you uh, by using an example. So here in this example, you can see two environments, environment one and environment two. And the environments have function cells in them. In this particular case, I have drawn two function cells in environment one. And uh, a function cell is associated with a name, as we shall see in a little while. So now let's define a, a function foo, and the purpose is to define it in environment one. Perhaps we have a REPL in environment one, or maybe we load a file uh, into environment one. As you can see, this function foo contains uh, two literals, namely the string hello and, the str and then the list ab, and it also contains a sort of a constant reference to uh, uh, an external function named bar. When this uh, function definition is compiled, we uh, create something that I call a function template. And the function template, as you can see, contains a reference to the compiled code, which would be a, a binary uh, machine instructions in a native, na native compiler. It also contains the literals from the code. So you can see the two references to the string hello and to the list uh, ab. And it contains um, every 
name of every reference to an external function. In this case, there was only one. So there's a single function named bar. And notice that the function template is not particularly related to any environment whatsoever. It's just an object that um, exists somewhere in the common lisp image. The next step of the, com of the process of loading the function definition into environment one is what I call tying. So when we tie the uh, function template to environment one, what that means is we replace or we create a function object. And the difference between the function object and the function template is that the function names of the template are replaced by references to function cells in the environment uh, in the function object. So in other words, a function is tied to an environment whenever its external references are relative to a particular first class environment. So in this case, the reference to the function bar uh, is uh, refers to the function cell in environment one. And also notice that this tying process has nothing to do with making the function available in the environment. There's no reference from the environment to the function object. All references are from the function object to the environment because they are uh, replacements for the function names that are used in the function foo and that are uh, function names to be called from the function foo. Uh, now, in this case, as you can see, the function cell bar uh, is empty. It doesn't contain, well, it actually contains uh, a function already, which when invoked signals an error. Uh, so uh, if, the, if we t uh, tie this function foo to environment one and refers to a function a bar that does not uh, exist, a new function cell is created uh, for that func uh, for that uh, function bar, and it's filled with, uh, like I said, uh, a default function that will signal an error in if it's invoked. And calling the function bar from the function foo is now a simple matter of taking the contents of this uh, function cell, like in sickle that would be a con cell, so you take the car of it, and then invoke that. Um, in a typical common lisp implementation, this cell would be part would be a slot in the, the symbol called bar instead. But it's the same kind of indirection that the common lisp standard requires, so that bar can be redefined at some later point. The final step of loading uh, function definition into environment one is to uh, execute the function setFF definition, which makes the function foo be defined in environment uh, in the environment one in this case. And we distinguish this relation by calling it the presence. So we say that function foo is present in environment one, and it's in this case also tied to environment one. But those are orthogonal concepts as presence is a relation from the environment to the function objects, and tying is a relationship from the function object to the environment. At some later point, we might define the function bar and load it into environment one, in which case it becomes present in environment one, as we can see here. And from then on, execute in function foo will call the function bar as expected uh, indirectly through the function cell for bar. And the last thing I need to show now in order to uh, explain how uh, sandboxing works is to show you how we can fill the function cell of a different environment, in this um, case environment 2, with a reference to the function foo, and it can even have a different name here called baz. And as you can see, the function foo is now present in both environments under different names, but it's still tied to environment one. 
So now if you imagine environment two being the typical work environment of some user, your environment, your env um, you uh, think of foo as being uh, the top level function compile and you think of bar as being part of the code generator of the compiler. You can now see that from environment two, you have access to the function compile, but you do not have access to the code generator. So this is what I mean by um, sandboxing in that from environment two, you cannot easily see the internals of the compiler, so you cannot alter them in any way. And that's all I had to say. So I hope this presentation explains how first class global environments work. And thank you so much for listening.